Yeah, thanks for the introduction, and uh, it's really good to see all of you. Um, yeah, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, video content creation with uh, diffusion models. So we all know that uh, diffusion models have been extremely successful for uh, text to image generation. So here I show the results of uh, the NVIDIA certified model, and you can see that uh, our model can generate photorealistic images, uh, which are with a lot of style variations. And of course, like there are so many other uh, text to image models uh, which are out there, uh, which can also generate like really good uh, images. So diffusion models have been really successful for this task. At a high level, uh, the way diffusion models work is uh, using this diffusion process. So um, we start with a clean data distribution, and then we gradually add noise to this. So we, uh, once we add noise, uh, you're going to get like a noisy data distribution. We add enough noise uh, till you get like a complete noise distribution. So this is called a forward diffusion process. And uh, what we want in diffusion model is uh, to reverse this process. Okay. And usually, we use a neural network to learn this reverse process. And once a neural network is uh, trained at this task, once we are able to do this reverse diffusion, we can generate samples by starting with the noise and then gradually denoise it till you get a clean image. And that's, that's like a very high level uh, uh, idea of like how diffusion models work. Now, what we are really interested in is if diffusion models can be used for video generation. <clears throat> and of course, the answer is yes, uh, otherwise I won't be giving this talk. So, uh, it is possible to generate uh, videos using diffusion models, but the task is quite challenging. So, let's, let's look at some of the challenges. So the, the, one of the first challenge is the video datasets that we have today, they are much smaller in size and uh, less diverse as compared to image datasets. We do have lots of videos, but the diversity in general is less as compared to images. So uh, for instance, in images you can have like a lot of different types of media, like uh, cartoons or uh, you can have sketches, a lot of style variations, and most of the existing video datasets we have lack such variations. And diffusion models generally need uh, lots of data to get good results. The second challenge is training video models are extremely expensive. So even for generating an image, diffusion models uh, take uh, quite some time to, uh, for the sampling. And uh, video models are even more expensive because now you need to generate a sequence of uh, frames, not just a single frame. And third, uh, maintaining temporal consistency in video, it turns out it's uh, a quite challenging task. <clears throat> so because of all these challenges, both from the data and the model side, the question that we ask is, uh, can we adapt a trained image diffusion model for video generation? Because the image generation model has already been trained well, like, uh, can we reuse that? Can we, can we reuse most of the knowledge uh, for video generation? So the idea is, let's say you have a, a pre-trained text-to-image model. So these models, if you give a noise map, you're going to do sampling, and then you're going to get like a bunch of uh, images. So these images that you generate, they, they, they won't have any uh, correlation there. Uh, so the idea is, let's start with this model. Let's add some additional layers. And these additional layers are the ones that we are going to use to model some kind of temporal consistency. And after we add these layers, we want to fine-tune it on the video data. And uh, the hope is, uh, after this fine-tuning, the model will learn this temporal consistency, and you will get uh, a good video. So to understand what these additional layers are that we would add, let's uh, very briefly look at image diffusion architecture. So uh, for uh, image generation, people generally use uh, a unit-based architecture, where you will have a sequence of blocks with feature maps uh, gradually dump sample than up sample. And we'll have some skip connections between them. And if you look uh, inside a block, we generally have some design like this, where uh, there is a residual uh, block, which is usually a, a bunch of pond layers uh, with some nonlinearities. And then we'll have like a self-retention and a cross-retention layer. So what self-retention does is the feature maps of an image attends to itself. So uh, you will have some region of an image attending to every other region of an image. And uh, this, uh, this attending uh, operation uh, really uh, learns a lot of knowledge in these models. 
And then we have this cross attention. Cross attention is a module that we uh, inject the text information. So you, what happens in cross, uh, cross attention is you have image features and text features, and image features and text features cross attend to each other. So uh, this is like uh, one of the standard uh, architectures that people use for image diffusion. Now, if you need to adapt it for video diffusion, so what we generally try to do is replace this attention with two modules. So the first module is uh, spatial attention, and the second module is a temporal attention. So the spatial attention is something similar to what we had for uh, the image generation models. Uh, uh, the, the frames. Each frame, uh, the features within them are going to attend to each other. And temporal attention is the, the module where you generally uh, learn this temporal dynamics. So what happens in temporal attention is you'll have features coming from different frames, and you'll have an attention over the temporal uh, sequence, and that that component will, uh, will help us learn this uh, temporal information. So after we add uh, these two components, we can uh, train a model, we can just uh, fine tune this model on uh, the videos and uh, append up a video diffusion model. But then uh, we, so this is one of the, uh, this are some of the things that most of the video diffusion uh, works do. Uh, so the thing that we started asking is can we do something to preserve the knowledge even more? Like can, can we, is there something that can be done to uh, learn, uh, to preserve the image uh, diffusion uh, information better? So to do this, we uh, started uh, taking a closer look at the noise correlations. So recall I told uh, that in diffusion models, uh, you start with a noise map, and then you uh, do sampling, and then like, you get a clean image. It turns out this uh, process, uh, it, it's, uh, it can be written as a coding, and it can be reversed. What that means is, given a clean image, you can go back to a noise map. So we, we, we are going to do the exact same thing now. We are going to take a pre-trained text image diffusion model, and we are going to go back to the noise maps for some of the in, some of the frames from a video. So what I show here is uh, four frames, all coming from different videos. And if you look at the noise maps, these uh, the noise maps are all scattered. On the other hand, if you have the images which all come from the same video, so these are the frames coming from the same video. The noise maps uh, learned by the uh, the, the noise maps mapped by the text to image model, they, they are clustered together. So, yeah, this difference becomes very clear if you look at uh, both these plots uh, side by side. Uh, and so, what we uh, propose to do is to modify the noise uh, prior in the diffusion models. So, uh, in conventional diffusion models, you have uh, noise maps which are all uh, independent, they are IID. So, the noise in frame I and frame K are independent. In our new proposed uh, noise prior, uh, what we do is we, we make sure that the frame i and frame j, they are correlated. And the way we model the correlation is uh, with this equation. So, so what we say here is noise at the frame i is uh, a linear combination of noise at frame minus 1 with some independent noise. And the, the parameter alpha here controls like how much correlation is there between different noise frames. And, and, and this, this noise model kind of uh, helps us learn this correlated noising process, and it will be similar to the, the, the noise maps would be well processed together, similar to what uh, I showed in the previous point. Uh, and yeah, so we, we call this idea of Yoko. So this is, uh, this is a paper uh, that, uh, that we're going to present in IGCV. Um, so yeah, when, when we train this model with this uh, prior, we show that uh, they're able to learn good uh, video models. Uh, we basically show that the fine-tuning video models becomes much more efficient. Okay, so with all these tricks, if we train a model uh, to generate videos, uh, these are the kind of videos we get. Let's look at some of the results. So this is a supernova explosion. This is a final world dancing. This is a floating bear. We have some more videos here. And we also compared our approach with uh, some of the other baselines. And uh, yeah, at the time of writing this paper, we got the state of the art results on the NSRB KD benchmark. So yeah, please open the poster session if you want to know more details about this work. It's on Friday.
Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, before I come to it, <laughs> I have a few more things I want to tell. Uh, okay, so what's what's more interesting about these text to video mo uh, generation models is uh, the ability to fine tune. So uh, generally, even though these models can generate just the videos uh, from the text, you can always fine tune it to add other conditioning inputs. And I believe that opens up a lot of applications. And uh, we already see a couple of papers coming on this. Uh, one example is, let's say you train an image condition video model, you can always like use some control net uh, to go from sketch to image and then to video. So this is just like one example. But generally, fine tuning opens up a lot of uh, really uh, lot, lot of applications from these text video models. And uh, we can also get a lot of video editing applications, and I believe that's where most of these uh, uh, foundation models will have uh, a lot of impact. So what's next in uh, video diffusion models. So one of the biggest challenges that we are having right now is uh, the temporal consistency. So here I show the results from uh, three models. One is our Pyoko and the other two models are uh, some, of the, some, of the, uh, some of the popular text video models out there. And you see that the temporal consistency is not good in most of the models. So uh, sometimes the hands uh, disappear and then appear, some objects uh, appear out of nowhere. And these kind of uh, temporal inconsistencies should should be addressed. So uh, the second challenge is inference speed. Uh, these models are uh, these diffusion models are extremely slow at inference. So uh, yeah, the inference speed should be improved. And the third challenge is how do we uh, model long sequence? Because most of these diffusion models they are uh, they they have shown results on short sequences, but modeling long sequences is uh, a challenging task. So with that, I would uh, like to conclude this talk. Uh, thank you for these insightful presentations. And let's see if anyone has questions, please feel free to raise your hand. I have two questions. So one of the ones, we've been actually messing around with the core voice correlation in our own training. Uh, mm -hmm. So, did you ever notice that the magnitude of motion would be diminished with higher values of your alpha? Uh, so, yeah, alpha is uh, a parameter that uh, controls uh, how much uh, motion that you can inject. Uh, so, we do have a trade-off uh, coming there. So, if you if you use like a really high value of alpha, like all, uh, I think higher or lower, yeah, I don't know motion equation. So, what one end of the regime is all noise maps become completely independent, and that will allow you to model like any sort of uh, variation. But on the other side, if you just have like a lower value of alpha, like you you preserve most of the information, but then uh, it'll limit your uh, uh, it'll limit uh, learning dynamics. So yeah, in our paper we showed that there is a trade-off, and you can actually find like a sweet spot uh, where you can learn the best of both. Got it. Um, and when you ran inference, you would use the same correlation for the initial one. Yeah. Thank you. Because 
uh, you've seen these large models perform really well when you have enough data. Uh, but but yeah, maybe like a combination of uh, some physics guided uh, motion modeling with a data driven approach might uh, work the best. Yeah. Thank you for questions. Thanks for the talk. So, like, looking at the result, it seems that the model picks up pretty easily the camera movements, right? Mm -hmm. And that's something that we have seen in, like across models. Yeah. But I guess related to the question I was just asked, like, how to maybe model uh, the deep, like the actual motions that we were hoping to see, like a person running or like maybe it's related to a non-rigid object. Uh, because it seems that the data-driven approach is giving us the camera motion pretty well, mm -hmm. but maybe not the other motion that we kind of are looking for. So. Really, is it data-driven? Maybe we just need some like better representations of the input to help. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I think again that's a good question. So um, yeah, data-driven would work well like, if you have enough data, uh, but sometimes. Adding uh, some kind of like conditional inputs are very effective with these models. So if you're able to somehow uh, get some kind of like motion representations and uh, uh, somehow use that as an intermediate step uh, to these models, uh, that might be a very promising approach. Uh, so so yeah, I think I think that approach has a lot of promise. If there is any other questions, uh, okay. I would like to ask you that kind of question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'd like to know uh, what's your opinion is about how to comprehensively like, evaluate and real generation models, you know, things. Uh, there is so many models trained on different data sets, but uh, in the most, they, they use clip similarities or FPP or some. Well, uh, I think this metric is not very comprehensive, so. Uh, yeah, uh, that, that's, that's a very good question. So, uh, I think. We don't have good metrics for video model right now. Uh, that's my personal feeling. And even though there are all these clip similarity or uh, these FID kind of metrics, uh, none of them uh, do justice in really measuring uh, the quality. And even even before you go to video, even for image, I don't think we have like good metrics. Like FID can uh, do a decent job, but then it still doesn't uh, really capture like which. Uh, images like really aesthetic, and the, the problem becomes much more worse with the video. I personally, when I work like what I do is I just uh, l like visualize it, like I just uh, cross my eyes. Uh, but I definitely think uh, as a community we should work towards developing good metrics. And unfortunately, I don't think there are any good metrics right now. And we should uh, aim to develop like automated metrics, not just uh, human evaluation. Thank you for your answers. And that's thanks again for going around the broadcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, now let's um, introduce the second keynote you know, speakers, uh, both the keeper, and uh, he's a research scientist and the team lead at Snap Research. He was previously a research scientist and manager at Google Research. He is passionate about exercising painful and meaningful visual effects. Today, his keynote will focus on generating personalized content with text to image diffusion models. And uh, now, let's give our warmest welcome to Dr. Uh, Keeper.
visual intelligence voice and that was um, satellite imaging is really fascinating. <coughs> I did my PhD in Tel Aviv University with uh, Daniel Lenore. Uh, during my PhD, I moved to China and I've been living in China for um, I lived in China for three years. It was pretty fascinating and I learned the language and the culture. Definitely miss China. Um, then I moved to Google, uh, sorry, I moved to Google, to the US, uh, and spent uh, three uh, wonderful years at the, uh, the CCI organization within Google Research, which is led by David Sellison, who is here. And I just recently joined SNAP, and I'm leading the generative AI uh, 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 research effort there. In Google, um, we did a lot of stuff, but when I just joined, uh, we were focusing on this super utilitarian um, features that can help people to improve their photos. Specifically, my team work, me and my team work with Magic Eraser. It's a fully automated pipeline that enables you to automatically detect distracting elements in your image and just remove them. Um, and we got a pretty nice uh, press coverage, um, and this feature was pretty successful. And back then, we were trying to think how we can leverage generative models to uh, improve people's images, and we were looking into guns and style guns, and we, we, we did a lot of stuff in this domain. But then something happened. Um, then, exactly a year and a half ago, in April 2022, Dali, Dali 2 was out, and basically then started the, the rise of, of generative AI. Followed by Dali 2, there were many uh, like parallel works <coughs> that brought to our world this um, unprecedented results of text-to-image, uh, specifically diffusion models. And we're super excited about it. And just at the time that we were super excited about it in Google, Stable Diffusion was released, and since then everything is a history because so many companies uh, um, just pop out and these capabilities were now were approachable. So when we just firstly saw, saw these capabilities, we were trying to think how we can actually use them, how we can actually control these text to image models, and when I say actually control, um, I will give you an example. So this is the um, first AI-generated magazine cover of the Cosmopolitan magazine, and um, this is uh, the way it was actually generated. Let me show you some. Uh, Quite right. This one, for example, was too boxy. Each time I adjusted my prompt over and over again, refining it to try to get the right image. And after many, many hours of trying hundreds of prompts, finally figured out the right one. It was. <laughs> So as you can see, prompt engineering is such a big hustle, and it's such a not intuitive to write. Why? Why we should like prompt engineer sentences to generate uh, like visual stuff? And it actually became a profession. You can find it, you know, on those like freelancing um, uh, platform. People, it's become a profession. People are become, becoming uh, experts in in, in uh, prompt engineering, but it doesn't make sense. Right, what happens if tomorrow like the text model is going to be replaced with something else? Should we replace our knowledge with something new? So given that uh, mindset, we're trying to tackle two main directions. We're trying to think how we can take these models just to edit images. And I know that now it seems trivial. Like, imagine like what happens like a year, a year and a half ago. How we can start from an image and then, for example, make this uh, boulevard less crowded. <coughs> or, and the second step, how we can guide the model with specific visuals. I don't want to generate a general person. I don't want to generate a general dog. I want to generate my dog. How we can customize, how we can personalize this model. This is another question we're trying to answer. So for the first branch, for the, for the content editing, um, when we just got these models and trying to play with them, it was pretty clear that it's really hard. Why hard? Because we generate a chihuahua dog running on the beach. And then we just stack this like adjective white and we try to make this chihuahua a white chihuahua dog running on the beach and this is what we get. And even if we try, you know, so many seeds, try, 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 this is the closest thing that we could get at that point and it doesn't make sense. Um, that's why we published Prompt to Prompt. This is, I think, our first work. It's a big avenue in the uh, generative AI domain. And, and Prompt to Prompt enables us to edit images by just editing their corresponding caption. So, for example, you can take a photo of a cat riding on a, bed or on, a, on a bike that was generated by your model, and you can replace this word uh, bike by the word car, and to get this thing, you can make your cake 
more decorated with jelly beans. You can just turn your, your image into a children drawing of the same thing, and you can, less, when you can make the boulevard less crowded, as I just mentioned. So just to give you some intuition, I know that probably most of you are aware of how diffusion models work, so I don't have to tell you that you start from noise, and gradually you, know, you turn this noise into an image based on the guidance of, of, of the text. But I think when we first saw these models and we were trying to analyze how to control them, it was so confusing and fascinated because the process is so convoluted, right? It's like so many uh, like iterations and you, you have a prompt, you have the null prompt, which will play a key role later. Each block in this unit contains like, like the, 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 the residual network, the self-attention module, the cross-attention model, and we didn't know how to start with controlling this thing. But what one obvious thing was that in the cross-attention layer, this is the first place where the image features are coming into interaction with the text features. And the mechanism is, is, is pretty, I mean, simple and familiar, I guess. It's attention. You get the image uh, input, which are being converted into query features. Then the sentence is, like each token in the sentence is, is converted into a key feature. And then we multiply them both to get some attention map, and this attention map is multiplied by the values that are coming also from the text. One of the first things that we've done is to visualize those cross, cross attention maps, and this is what we get. Um, and I was super excited to see this because I think it's the first time that we were actually, we, we could interpret um, deep networks. Because usually, you know, it's, it's like a black box and the train waits and you get something, you don't know how to get it, but here we can actually see that each of the words, especially the nouns, has a visual interpretation within those like deep representation. Um, and it happens from the very beginning of the diffusion process. If this is like the diffusion time. Um, so utilizing this uh, uh, um, finding, we can now just fix the cross attention layer after we generate. Imagine that we generate one image with the text. You know, we can now fix the cross attention layers, and we can generate again and again the same image with different noise, but now we can fix the semantic composition of the image. And this is very cool. It's one way to control the, uh, the, the generation and you know, the, the semantic layout. Another interesting thing is we can do the same thing even if we generate the same image with a new word. So we imagine that we just we want to generate a bunch of different cakes. Lemon cake, cheese cake, monster cake. So if we just replace the word, even if we fix the noise, we get a different cake each time. But if we fix also the cross attention layer, we get the exact same structure and it's, it's kind of a semantic texture transfer, right? We just replace the texture and we get the exact same structure of cake. Um, another interesting thing is that it's a diffusion process, so we can fix the attention layer through all the process, but we can also fix it just you know, for part of the process, and this is how it looks like. If we don't fix it at all, on the uh, leftmost uh, example, you can see that if we try to, to change this image of a cat riding on a bike to a train, we get a totally new image, a new image of a cat riding on a train. But if we fix it through all the way, we get an image that has high resemblance to the original image. And you see that the train is kind of uh, squeezed into this shape of the bicycle, but we can play with it. It's a trade-off between you know how much uh, fidelity to the structure we want and how much fidelity to the semantics. Um, so prompt to prompt was nice. But it work, works actually. It works actually only on synthetic images uh, because you have to generate an image, and only when you generate, you have the cross attention layers. And the big question was how we can apply it to real images. And then we uh, published our text inversion. And the idea behind our text inversion was let's try to first invert the real image into the model. And once we do it, we, we can actually now generate this image with this model, and we can do prompt to prompt again. And then we can take this image of the cat and making this cat like a silver sculpture, a tiger, or you can even make it sleeping. Um, so on a, on a very kind of brief high level overview, the way that non-text inversion work is uh, we start with an A process which is called DDI inversion, we just take the simple DDI process and we, we invert it. Um, and when we invert it with the main branch, like with the main conditional branch of the diffusion process, everything is fine, like we can very back and forth and we can reconstruct the image with this given caption that we provided. But the diffusion model we have to generate the images with another branch which is called the classifier free guidance branch. 
which is important for like editing and reverse generation. And if we do naive DDI inversion and then we um, then do the reverse diffusion process with the classifier free guidance component, we get some deviation. We get some error that is accumulated through the process. And the idea behind non-text inversion is to utilize this non-text that is injected in the other branch of the process and everybody ignored you know, uh, for our work. And we, we, we basically optimize this non-text. We optimize a sequence of non-text such that we are compensating, um, uh, compensating the gap that was created here. After compensating the gap, we can get a perfect inversion of that image. So now, without changing the model at all, we can take this noise that we inverted, we can take the caption, and we can generate our image. And the nice thing is that now we can use prompt to prompt. We can take a real image with a given caption, a man in glasses eating a donut, and we can change his appearance, we can uh, change his expression, we can change the background, we can change the donut to pizza, we can do so many things on real images. So this was another uh, kind of exciting result. Since it's a, it's a workshop on videos, so I just want to say that this work has been used to for like many use cases also in video editing. One of them just combines prompt to prompt with optimizing a, a sim a one null text inversion across all the frames to get a consistent, temporary consistent video editing like this one, um, uh, which is really cute. And this is another example where, we, again, we, we do this inversion per frame, and now we can turn this video into night gradually by just pushing uh, the cross attention rates more and more. And we can, and, uh, so for the second branch, personalized generation, um, it wasn't revealed to us at all how, again, how I can generate my own dog. I don't want to describe my dog with words. I want to provide a few reference images and now to find kind of a personalized subspace um, within this, this model. And um, I hope that at this point you heard about Dreamwood. Um, but this is what Dreamwood enables uh, back then. So with Dreamwood, you can take a few images of your dog and you can embed them into the output domain of the model by fine-tuning the model. And then you can generate your own dog in different contexts and different interactions with the world. You can make swimming in the ocean, you can even haircut, you can put him in a bucket. And it's been a year since we've published Dreamwood, and I'm still super excited every time I see these results uh, again and again. Um, so the concept behind Dreamwood was that with those models that are guided by text and even guided by images. For example, DALI 2, you can provide an image as an input. You cannot still, you cannot reproduce the exact you know, um, object with, with just even image guidance, and even not with, with like text guidance. You can maybe change the context based on text guidance, but you cannot get the actual plot. But Remove enables, enables that, and uh, uh, the way we do it is by simply fine-tuning the model take a few images of our dog and its class dog and we and, and dream with basically find a model such that a new identifier in this case V from now on is going to represent our dog and then in inference after fine tuning we can refer to our dog with this unique identifier V so we can say a V dog in the beach and we get our dog in the beach and a V dog walking on the carpet and we get our dog the way we do it in practice is um, simply fine-tuning. We keep training the model with those few images and reconstructing our dog when the prompt that is injected is a big dog. But in parallel, what we do in order to, to let the model not forget the concept, the general concept of dog, and to be able to generate more dogs beyond our dog, we keep training the model um, with uh, reconstructing other dogs when we provide a sentence a dog. Okay, so two objectives. Please generate my dog when I say a V-dog, and please generate other dogs when I say a dog. Since we worked with Imogen originally, we also had to find you the super resolution models, so the final great details of our subject are being preserved. So with Dreamwood, you, take, you can take a few input images of uh, any object, and you can embed it within the input domain of the output domain of the model and generate it in a, a pretty um, a good quality. You can also take this teapot and generate it in different contexts and even in different materials. You can take your, your dog and generate it in different you know, artistic conditions. And again, it's not standards, right? We, we, we modify the pose of the dog and we can do <coughs> so many crazy things. 
And uh, another very exciting application of Dreamwolf is the ability to take a character you know, and, and to tell a coherent, a consistent story with the same character. So imagine, yeah, I guess, it, you know, um, what was the impact of these kind of things. Um, so when we published Dream Dreamwolf, we were lucky that you know, Stable Diffusion was released a couple of days before that, and then Dreamwolf was and still is everywhere. Uh, we see you know, uh, many creative ways that people are utilizing Dreamwolf and many startup companies that you know, were raised just based on, on this um, uh, idea. People are making headshots, stickers, holiday cards, so many good things. Um, I was really excited you know, to be able to generate my split vision myself, to envision the younger version of myself you know, in my yearbook, and to see myself as a superhero and like all these kind of good things. Um, some other follow-up works that related to video, well, again, we are you know, in a video workshop, so um, this DreamX work enables us to, to generate um, subjects, sorry, um, yeah, to generate subjects uh, with a few images uh, in, 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 in new videos. So you provide a few images of, of, of uh, an object, you can, you can generate you know, novel videos of that object, and the concept is really similar. The idea is just using you know, a text-to-video model instead of a text-to-image, and uh, in this work, those folks use the text-to-video, uh, the image and text-to-video work. And also AnimeDiff that was presented here earlier, and the really nice thing about AnimeDiff uh, uh, is that the concept there is kind of agnostic to the fine-tuning of the model. So you can take your own personalized model and animate it without customizing the, uh, um, the um, the, the image to, to, to video approach without customizing it to your fine-tuned model. So you can take your personalized model and upgrade the video. I'm super excited to see those results um, not so long ago. Where are the challenges? Where are the other challenges in, in customized or personalized generation? So we have a few follow-up words, but I think still it's, it's, it's not solved yet. Still, to get the best results, we need to fine-tune the model. We need to modify the weights. Um, it's expensive to utilize GPUs you know, per user, per customer, and to save, you know, save the model per user. How we can generate multi-subjects, how we can have a dictionary which just grows with time. Uh, it's also a very uh, kind of open question. There is a pretty, uh, like, it's pretty limited now for a few, five, six subjects of the net. How we can make personalization for a single image. There are, again, there are some works in this, these domains, but I think that these are still kind of pretty open challenges. Um, to just wrap up the talk, I want to say a couple of words about uh, Snap because it just moved to Snap, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited about the opportunity. And um, Snap is a great platform with a big user base, where it's a classic place you want to, to have your novel ideas, novel effects, and that. A few weeks later, for like for a million users to try it, and. Um, the mindset of Snap at the moment is how we can actually leverage and utilize those assets of users, images, videos, in order to, to generate content that you know, will be captivating for them, um, will engage them, will be personalized to their taste and, and, and assets. And how we can make the camera actually generate. Um, and also hiring. And if you are uh, you know, into um, some of those open positions as research scientists or student interns, student interns, interns uh, please feel free to reach out and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, well, thanks again for uh, this enlightening keynote and let's see if anyone who wants to have a question just feel free to raise your hand.
Yeah, so, so definitely. I, I think that um, the idea behind prompt to prompt is to utilize the cross attention mechanism to connect between uh, tokens and, and regions in the image. So if you provide a more strict guidance when you, for example, find your model and you say, oh, so this subject should be connected to this unique identifier and this subject connected to this unique identifier, if you, if you add some, some loss that will you know, make this clear um, connection, you definitely have to separate. That being said, the capability of the model to handle it, even with this kind of guidance, which is really, I would say, the state of the art capability to, to modify, uh, and like to separate subjects. That being said, uh, when we fine tune, it still seems like the, the energy, for example, if you think about Laura, and you try to fine tune to, to modify a set of weights, you know, and connect it to each unique identifier, we still see some semantic overlap at the end of the day between subjects. So, especially if we try you know, to, to, to embed them 100 different uh, person. 100 different ways, specifically, you will see that you cannot actually distinguish, even if you utilize the cross attention mechanism in the fine tuning. I see that people are kind of, you know, there are some kind of more naive approaches to blend subjects if you if you have different models for a different subject and then you do some kind of segmentation and you know you, you paste the stuff. This, this is, of course, no more naive solution that people are doing. But how we can, we can add a, a new dictionary of 100 subjects in, into a Thank you for the questions. And is there any other questions? Hi, thanks for a great talk. Uh, so I was wondering if there is any way to incorporate the edition uh, functionality uh, directly within uh, the training of the model because it seems that uh, most of your approaches are trying to come up with an edition editing mechanism that uh, comes attached to the train model, but uh, would, would it be interesting to uh, create one uh, uh, as a default uh, functionality of the text image model, for example? So, just I want to verify that I understand. So, like, for example, is we're talking about the multi subject problem, for example? Yeah. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so we, you can say that, oh, right, for this, like, um, the model definitely know more than 100 celebrities, right? So it's all the celebrities like many times. But to get this model, we had to, to apply like a large scale training. We, we cannot do this large scale training now for you know, every subset of, of 100 subjects. That's why we have to take a given you know, large scale model and to fine tune it. And when we do the fine tuning, it doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. So, so if we would be able to you know, embed everybody in one large scale training, that might be possible. Let's say, uh, for instance, so, so we had like a video with uh, Reddit, I guess, uh, that was uh, changed to uh, another site. Uh, so maybe if this edition functionality with, uh, not with the particular style that you want at this time is uh, done beforehand with training, then maybe uh, if the mechanism is embedded directly in the model, then you can just provide the image in which you want the Reddit to be transformed into maybe. Did you get what I mean? Yeah, <coughs> sorry. Yeah, definitely, uh, but, but I think it's correct if, if the, the mechanism is like, I mean, the capability is there, right? If you think about people, like I want to generate you, I can maybe invert your image, but I cannot what know that it's you, right? Yeah. But definitely, you know, like uh, guiding the process through uh, like visual examples, if it's already embedded in the output domain of the model, this is something Any other questions? Is there any other questions? Okay, that's thank again for this very helpful. Thank you so much for this presentation. All right, today we've had great researchers on stage and also a talented artist here. For our last keynote speaker of the day. I have the privilege to introduce uh, Do Dr. Hugo Cassel-Duclay, who is not only a great researcher, but also a talented artist. Hugo wears many hats. He earned his PhD from Insta IP Paris and Emilia in 2021, and he now serves as a postdoc at Sorbonne University. Besides academia, 
Hugo is also a groundbreaking artist. With two of his friends, he co-founded Obvious Art in 2018. The same year, they sold a portrait of Edmond Bellamy, the first piece of AI-generated portrait in history at an auction of $432,000. With this sale, Hugo and his co-founders played the trail of a new era for digital art and art more generally. For that, they were selected among the Forbes 30 under 30 in 2020, and since then, their works have been exhibited in many galleries all around the world. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Cassidy. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, I needed that introduction because uh, I didn't have one, so that's very great. Uh, so today I want to talk to you about uh, basically what we do at, at, at Obvious. Uh, so we are, we are three friends from Chaibot that decided to uh, to uh, work with AI to create works of art uh, back in 2017. So, uh, as it was said, I'm a researcher in that domain, and basically we had uh, this idea uh, in 2017. And um, so, as it was said, also uh, our first, uh, basically our first uh, series of artworks was a series of portraits. Uh, so the one that you can see on the left is the one that was sold uh, at Christie's. It's called Edmond de Bellamy, and uh, basically we were. Uh, dealing with uh, generative adversarial networks, uh, which at the time were the best algorithms that you could, uh, that you could use for uh, image generation, and we were fascinated by uh, their potential. And so we decided to create this series, and then uh, we were contacted by Christie's to uh, do this auction, and so uh, many things happened uh, after that. And since then, we've been uh, creating uh, uh, different types of artworks and uh, conducting uh, artistic projects and research projects. Uh, on generative AI. Uh, on the middle and on the right, you can see all the types of uh, series that we created in 2019 and 20 uh, in this uh, era where we were uh, using GANs and uh, working with uh, Craftman uh, to create uh, artworks, uh, reinterpreting different, different, uh, different uh, artistic, uh, uh, artistic approaches. Uh, most recently, we uh, did our entry at uh, Davis Gallery, which is uh, our gallery today, and now we are using uh, all the different types of algorithms that uh, are available to create our series. In this work, we uh, worked uh, on the seven wonders of the, of the ancient world, and we worked with historians to, um, to gather the, the actual description of the seven wonders, because uh, besides the pyramids, uh, we can't really know what they look like, and so we wanted to use take to image algorithms to reconstruct them, and uh, and uh, that was uh, the show that we did uh, last uh, last winter. Uh, so we did many exhibitions uh, within uh, our different artistic projects in different museums and uh, galleries, and uh, we also work with NFTs. Actually, we've been uh, creating NFTs since. Uh, before it was a uh, hype and uh, a little bit weird with all this uh, uh, monkey stuff that you saw in 2021. Uh, basically, NFTs, uh, uh, there is this small part of NFTs that is uh, not scammy and it's uh, really interesting for uh, digital artists uh, to create their work and to commercialize them. So, besides all the frenzy that you've seen, uh, there are many talented artists that are using NFTs to uh, now sell their work in galleries. And, uh, and it's actually uh, a great thing in this uh, digital art space. So we've been creating those since 2018. We had the chance to, to uh, be invited to the Beta Super Round and we did many different um, projects with NFTs. Uh, we also like to, uh, to work with uh, brands as well. So I think it's interesting to, uh, for, uh, for me to show you that because uh, all of the algorithms that we saw today, uh, basically we try to use them for artistic projects and now you can see how uh, by, do, by doing different projects with brands maybe uh, we can uh, showcase some creation that were done using those algorithms so it's kind of a practical application to uh, everything that you saw today. Uh, so for instance uh, we had so we did the collaboration with the Alpine brands uh, from the uh, Formula One uh, brand who also makes uh, uh, a car and we did the art car uh, where we invented the circuit uh, using uh, generative adversarial and networks and we did some uh, covering of the uh, of the of the car using uh, other types of algorithms type transfer and different type of uh, 
of regenerative AI algorithms. And more recently, we did a, a bike for uh, one team of the Tour de France. Uh, so all of the different type of rotation that you can see on the bike are kind of the human machine collaboration between the bike and the cyclist. So we thought it was a, a, a cool, uh, a good way to uh, connect to our work, which is also collaboration human machine and. Uh, Basically, uh, all of the uh, concentric circles are generated, so it's how uh, we used AF to do it. And uh, okay, so we're gonna close the video, but um, uh, maybe I can uh, just take a quick moment. But we did, uh, so we did a collaboration with Opera Paris uh, to, uh, to do actually uh, uh, a project around NFTs, and so uh, we were able to. Uh, create uh, different types of uh, animation that was sold to the different uh, collectors uh, that are interested in, uh, in the opera. So it was a way to uh, onboard them on our creation and uh, on this technology of NFTs as well. And here you can see uh, we used uh, some of the latest algorithms uh, from uh, uh, early 2023 uh, with uh, video initialization and uh, other types of uh, really great algorithms that you have today. Uh, one cool thing is that if you're interested in our work, uh, we've, been, uh, so we've been creating for the last five years and there's actually a documentary that was uh, uh, filmed on us uh, during the last year and so it will be uh, uh, released on Canal Plus, a uh, French, uh, French uh, uh, TV, uh, TV channel, so it's uh, 72 minutes uh, on our work, so maybe if you're interested you can check this out uh, in November. So today I want to talk to you uh, also about uh, the research that we do our views. So the idea is that um, I showed you the different type of artistic project that we conduct, but uh, the whole idea was also to uh, get into uh, the actual research ourselves. So that it is an ambitious project that we had uh, for uh, the longest time, but we were uh, we needed time to organize all of this, and now we are happy to announce that. Uh, we are actually creating, besides our artistic studio, an academic uh, laboratory. So the idea is that uh, the creation that we will do in this uh, research lab uh, are, will be uh, created uh, with the aim of having artistic applications. So I think uh, uh, you can think of all the type of algorithms that were presented in the last presentation, for instance. That's uh, typically the type of uh, algorithms that we are interested in. Uh, it's a partnership with uh, Sorbonne University uh, and uh, we have some uh, public funding of, of uh, 1 million dollar to uh, 1 million euro to uh, for the next four years to uh, to work on this so we'll be hiring as well so if you're interested uh, uh, in working in uh, genetic AI research with artistic application definitely uh, in uh, the research axes that we're interested in are text to video. So uh, we've been working, so for instance, on the on the replication of the Fenaki algorithm uh, in order to get uh, uh, to get started uh, with uh, training big models and uh, uh, having a solid code base. And we're also interested in uh, the, the the mind to image field. I don't know if the if the name will stick, but uh, there are many type of uh, uh, of uh, research paper now that are uh, taking uh, fMRI uh, sessions, uh, scans of the brain uh, while people are watching images and are trying to decode these, those images. And so we think it's a very powerful tool that could be used to uh, create some artworks. And so we are working on this with, uh, with also uh, some uh, medical facilities. Uh, in obvious research, uh, our, basically our aim would be to uh, provide uh, all of the algorithms that create uh, open source. So for instance, we did a, a first step on the Fenaki, re on the Fenaki replication and, uh, and we issued the code and the, and the model on GitHub and Hackintax. So. Uh, so basically to wrap this up, uh, our vision is to uh, create uh, artistic series that uh, demonstrate the application of the creative tools that uh, you have been, uh, uh, you have been uh, following today. And basically, while doing our science and our research, we want to uh, create scientific papers and uh, uh, creation tools that uh, really allow for some, for some uh, artistic 
innovation uh, because we've been doing that for the past years, but now we want to kind of uh, accelerate that. And I think it's interesting to have uh, those uh, direct partnership between universities and artists. So we are very excited to uh, to do that. Uh, so, if you want to discuss or if you want to reach us, uh, don't hesitate. We have the Twitter at uh, Obvious Research and you can follow uh, our artistic projects at uh, Obvious Art on uh, Instagram. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Rico, for uh, your wonderful talk. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Any questions? All right, I actually have a question for you now. Uh, since you're both a researcher and an artist, and, and you showed us really great works of art, I was wondering where your inspiration comes from, if it's directly from the tool and from your research, and so from the technology itself, or from somewhere else. How do you balance this, these two roles, these two hats? Uh, so I think what's, in, what's interesting with our work at Oculus is that uh, we are a trio of artists, so that, uh, so it's, already kind of uh, unusual to uh, work with AI to create art, but it's even more unusual to uh, be a three of artists working with a tool, but actually uh, it's pretty easy to be free uh, working with AI because uh, uh, we can uh, basically uh, uh, brainstorm over the type of uh, project that we want to do, and then uh, the, the actual creation, uh, purely visual creation process, is deferred to the algorithm, so it's kind of uh, the way we've been working on this, and so that's how our inspiration comes from. Because uh, we've been friends since childhood, we are uh, we we are passionate about many stuff, and uh, we have many stuff in common as well. And so I think from all of those discussion, uh, so Gauthier might be uh, talking about something, I might be. Uh, I might be in two, and then we might uh, exchange stuff, and uh, ideas will come out out of that. Great. Thanks. And I guess since most of us here don't have like art friends, for instance, or any knowledge about art, do you have any uh, insights of how to find partners, for instance, or how to start collaborating, or how to just start making art? Yeah. So um, uh, on our side, like uh, I think one of the one of the good thing that we did is that we just uh, want so. We had some ideas in mind, but we just started doing those. So I think uh, many of the artists that we can see on Twitter rising and stuff like this, they just uh, are uh, uh, basically spamming what they do. And uh, once uh, they find something interesting, uh, they might follow this up. So I think like uh, you shouldn't be ashamed of what to do and just uh, try to share it with uh, as much as much as, as much people. Uh, as possible, and then trying to kind of uh, uh, have some feedback around what you do, and uh, and then uh, if you talk to people, then naturally you will get some collaboration and stuff like this, and uh, it will get you going. Right. Thanks. Um, any questions from the audience? All right. Then I think we're going to close the session yeah. now. Thank you very much for all coming, and thank you very much. For I'm going to have some, uh, a closing session, closing remarks session that I will give us now. Thank you. All right. Uh, so thanks for uh, joining us today for this workshop, and we have a very wonderful program. And. Uh, we have very great keynotes and uh, most importantly we have all of you and we have great round tables and AI film sessions and also we receive very good feedback from all of you. And uh, we would like to acknowledge uh, the people that who contribute to our workshop and uh, we congratulate again for the people who get their awards. And also we are delighted to see that people see, uh, exchange their ideas in the poster session. And uh, this also thanks to the program committee and also our outstanding reviewer. And also we want to congratulate again about our best paper award. 
So in the end, thanks for attending this year's CBU workshop and we hope to see you in the future and let us know your feedback.